for the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service and Florida Sea Grant here in Miami-Dade County. This webinar series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. We will be offering this webinar series every Friday at 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. through the month of June. Although we can't see you in person right now, we're excited to offer this series and connect with you despite all that's happening around us. Thank you for tuning in today. Everyone in this webinar is currently muted, so I ask that you type any questions into the chat box, which I will be moderating. We will be answering questions at the end of this session. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out in the next few days. Please follow us on social media where we will be announcing Friday's conversation topic at the beginning of each week. If you'd like to receive an email reminder instead with the weekly topic and registration links, please email me or let me know in the chat box. Now I'm gonna turn it over to today's presenter, Kasia Williams of Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. Hello everyone and thank you for joining in on this week's conservation conversation. This week will be on seagrass and underwater network. So I am Kasia Williams. I'm an interpretive program leader at Miami Eco Adventures, which is a part of Miami-Dade County Parks and Recreation and Open Spaces. So what is seagrass? Seagrass is the almost deceptive name for a type of submerged aquatic vegetation that grows in meadows along the ocean floor. Unlike the name suggests, seagrass is a flowering plant and not actually a grass at all. These plants photosynthesize to make food, limiting the area they can grow to depths that light can still penetrate through. There are 60 species of seagrasses worldwide, with seven being found in Florida. From those seven, there are three predominant species found growing in the shallow waters of Biscayne Bay. The seagrasses of Biscayne and other South Florida regions include one of the largest expanses of seagrass communities in the world. Those seven species of seagrasses found in Florida are turtle grass, shoal grass, manatee grass, star grass, paddle grass, witchin grass, and Johnson's grass. So these are the three most common ones found in Florida. And on your far left, we have turtle grass, which is the most common. You can find this off the coast of Florida and the Caribbean. It's probably dinner time for a few of you. So to bring in a food analogy, turtle grass is flat like fettuccine and ribbon-like, growing to 14 inches and half an inch wide. This makes it easily identifiable from the other types of seagrass. The common name turtle grass refers to the green sea turtle, the herbaceous sea turtle species that feeds on its leaves. Manatee grass, which is right here in the middle, can be found in many of Florida's estuaries and is the second most common seagrass found in the state. Manatee grass is cylindrical like spaghetti and can reach lengths of up to 20 inches. Manatee grass is named such as it is the favorite food of the manatee, a federally protected species that is facing serious threats of loss of habitat. Shoal grass is a unique seagrass in that it grows in disturbed waters that are too harsh for turtle or manatee grass. Locally, you can find this grass off the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico coast down to the Caribbean. The flat, narrow, angel-like hair blades grow up to a maximum of four to six inches and only 0.8 inches wide. I'd also like to touch on uh, Johnson seagrass for a little bit, just because it's more rare and unique. Johnson's bass was first recognized as a separate species in 1980. It was found in the Indian River Lagoon right up north from us and was named after J. Seward Johnson Sr., the founder of the Harvard Branch Oceanography Institute in Fort Pierce, Florida. Under the Endangered Species Act, the National Marine Fisheries Service considers Johnson's grass to be a threatened species due to its limited distribution. This seagrass can be found in central Biscayne Bay, north of Virginia Key, to the Sebastian Inlet. It has been found in flood tidal deltas, muddy basins, sandy shoals, and near canals, meaning it can tolerate fluctuations of salinity and water clarity. 
There is a recovery plan for Johnston seagrass currently being developed, and there are management plans now in place for the Indian River Lagoon, Biscayne Bay, and Lake Worth Lagoon. Seagrass, similar to nearly all mature flowering plants, have distinct above and below ground systems. Seagrasses share a number of similarities with terrestrial plants, but after millions of years of evolution, have also had the benefit of some aquatic friendly adaptations. Seagrass creates its own food and produces oxygen through the process of photosynthesis using structures called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts can be found above ground in the leaves of the seagrass. Moving lower, we find the leaf sheath. Because seagrasses do not have to compete with the force of gravity, they don't need strong or hardy stems or trunks. Instead, they have these tube-like leaf sheaths that allow more flexibility and movement in the high energy currents and waves of the ocean. Underneath the leaf sheaths, we can find the node, which is where new leaves will originate from. And beneath that is the vertical rhizome, which is similar to a stem. Seagrasses also have horizontal rhizomes, allowing for numerous shoots to grow from one stretch of horizontal rhizome asexually. Last but not least is the root system, which grows from below the, the horizontal rhizome. So a quick poll question if you guys just wanna answer this. I'll give everybody a few seconds. So what are some of the benefits to having a horizontal rhizome system? Does it increase photosynthesis production? Does it improve stability of the plant and allow for asexual reproduction? Does it raise a plant above the seafloor, closer to the sunlight? Take nutrients from the ocean floor substrate in greater quality? I'll give everybody a few more seconds to answer. And let's see what the right answer is. So it's B, improved stability of plant allows for asexual reproduction. Okay. So what are some benefits to having a healthy seagrass ecosystem in our oceans? We'll start at the bottom right here. Um, it can stabilize substrate and improve water quality. Due to their horizontal rhizomes, seagrasses are actually excellent at compounding and stabilizing the sediment on the ocean floor. The dense roots also help create a thick mat that is great protection during storm surges and hurricanes. Researcher Greg Gunnell, in a Belize study titled The Power of Three, Coral Reefs, Seagrasses, and Mangroves, found that these three ecosystems together can substantially moderate incoming wave energy and loss of mud sediment. While mangroves alone can achieve most of these coastal protection benefits, corals and seagrasses are likely to help reduce the risk of shoreline erosion, promote shoreline stability offshore of the mangroves, and reduce nearshore currents. The study also found that in the barrier reef, nearshore seagrasses apply more protective services than live corals, and under, circumstances, cer under certain circumstances, seagrasses can also compensate for impacts of short or long-term degradation of the reef. So you can see here the wave height varying right before it hits the reef, and then it really starts to level off around the seagrasses. And by the time it hits mangroves, everything's cool, calm, and collected. This illustration posted by Miami-Dade County on a report of seagrasses in the Biscayne Bay shows the framework for resilience and it shows the relationship between different ecosystems and how building resilience really begins with good water quality, including low nutrient inputs. So again, to that power of three, we can have our mangroves here, seagrass, maybe a coral reef over here, and they all tie into each other and they all benefit each other. In this photo on the left, we can see sediment and algae buildup along the seagrass. Seagrasses can actually take up dissolved nutrients from water that occurs as runoff from land. Biscayne Bay is the receiving water for much of Miami-Dade County and portions of Broward County, 
both of which are experiencing rapid development and population growth. The photo to the right shows the Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserve in dark blue, which encompasses almost 65,000 submerged acres. Referencing back to one of my beginning slides where I mentioned that Biscayne and other South Florida areas include some of the largest expanses of seagrass globally, this means that South Florida could be equipped to handle the growing demands for clean water and also be able to combat the potential increase of irrigation or wastewater runoff. Seagrasses also function as a habitat for a number of aquatic animals with their long soft leaves offering a field of hiding spots and refuge. Some year round residents include pipefishes, seahorses, and sea urchins such as the variegated sea urchin in the right picture. Coral reef fishes such as the ocean sturgeon fish, gray snapper, and various parrot fish utilize seagrasses as a nursery and will even stay on as juvenile and immature adults. About 85% of commercial and recreational species in Florida depend on seagrasses for at least part of their life cycle. Lastly, seagrasses offer fantastic foraging ground for prey and as a food source itself. Nurse sharks, stingrays, catfish, mullet, and a plethora of others lurk in the seagrasses in search of food. Wading and swimming birds such as egrets and double-crested cormorants also dive down into the shallows to feed. As I previously mentioned, the green sea turtle, an endangered sea turtle species, primarily feeds on turtle grass. So coming back to this pyramid, I'll go to the top of the pyramid, which is the carbon sink. It might be the top and look the smallest, but it's also equally as important. So in the fight against climate change, reducing carbon emissions is a crucial step we need to take. Another thing that must be considered is that greenhouse gases linger in our atmosphere for hundreds of years. So we also need to find ways to remove those emissions. One sorely untapped resource, what I like to consider the underdog in the combat against carbon and the, is the bountiful meadows of seagrass in the ocean. Here's a map that shows the subtropical and tropical meadows where a large fraction of global seagrass is found as well as in the Mediterranean Sea. Due to the need of seagrass to be in shallow light-filled waters, you can see their proximity to land and human development. Zooming in a little bit closer to home, we can see the results of a Florida Fish and Wildlife Survey of seagrass, which shows a good amount of dense seagrass cover. A research paper found in the Marie Pollution Bulletin published recent data estimating that seagrasses, together with salt marshes and mangroves, are responsible for capturing up to 70% of organic carbon in the marine realm, making them one of the most intense carbon sinks on the planet. Seagrass meadows bury carbon at a rate that is 35 times faster than tropical rainforests, and their sediments never become saturated. Furthermore, while terrestrial forests bind um, carbon for decades, because a significant amount of seagrass production occurs underneath the sediment within their rhizome and roots, seagrass meadows can bind carbon for a millennium. Seagrasses are not as susceptible as terrestrial forests to detrimental practices like deforestation which can release CO2 that is stored in the trees when they're felled. The research on seagrass as a carbon sink is woefully untapped. However, much of the re research I have found strongly shows that seagrass communities are net autotrophic, therefore acting as a net CO2 sink in the biosphere. However, they do face several challenges and threats of their own. There is evidence that increased loss rates of seagrass ecosystems globally may be weakening the carbon sink capacity of the biosphere. So basically what this graph is showing is just that CO2 and um, oxygen exchange in the carbon. And as you can imagine, these rhizomes are going to stay here regardless of if the leaves are on there. So they really do trap in that, that carbon into the ocean floor sediment, which doesn't get disturbed much unless there's like storms or human behavior in it. So now some threats to the seagrass ecosystem. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission found seagrasses to be one of the most threatened marine habitats in Florida. The FWC found the top threats to be reduced water quality, whether from runoff or waste, temperature and salinity stress, habitat destruction, and physical damage due to propeller scarring and vessel groundings. 
This map by the National Park Service shows an area of the Florida Bay's seagrass population. This area in red right here is containing dead turtle grass in patches of various size that's not 100% dead yet. The yellow part over here is mixed live and dead impacted areas. The green is healthy turtle grass, which we're fortunate enough to have a large portion of. And then this striped area right here is dense seagrass that's most at risk of die off expansion. So it, it is a growing problem. It's clearly already a problem, but there are ways to combat it as well. The rerouting of the flow of fresh water to the bay as part of a massive drainage system to support much of Broward, Palm Beach, and Dade, coupled with periods of drought, have caused massive seagrass die-offs. Following a drought in 2015, extreme temperatures and heightened salinity reduced the amount of oxygen that remained dissolved in the water, damaging the health of turtle grass in the bay. During the summer and fall of 2015, approximately 40,000 acres of seagrass died. The picture above shows a healthy seagrass bed on the left-hand side, while the right shows a yellow haze in waters that have high salinity, low oxygen, and a high sulfate that was observed in the 2015 die-off areas in Florida Bay. So you can even see just immediately the, that there's the water clarity changed because the seagrass isn't there to help with that, with that cleansing. Macroalgal and phytoplankton blooms are another issue plaguing seagrasses, most likely having to do with, again, that lack of fresh water, nutrients and water runoff from urban areas and farms, which add nitrogen and phosphorus to the water, and even die off from the seagrass itself, which decomposes on the ocean floor and then adds more nutrients in. These photos here show the Julia Tuttle Basin located in the middle of Biscayne Bay. This is a man-made redirect and channel, and these also severely disrupt the natural vegetation that grows there. These photos I took from Google Maps, and this is a current day, this is a current day channel. But as we can see by these photos provided by the Everglades Restoration done by Derm. In 2011, the seagrass area surrounding the channel was much more lush and prominent. And you can see just that shoot few short four years, the dieback is clearly visible. Another detrimental and human driven issue is physical damage to seagrass from propeller scarring and vessel groundings. The Florida Museum found that in South Florida, over 30,000 acres of seagrass have been scarred by the boat propellers. The most extensive damage is seen in the Florida Keys, Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, and the North Indian River Lagoon. Between 10 and 20% of the seagrasses have been lost in the Keys due to repeated scarring and boat grounding. Scarring is actually primarily caused by large numbers of small boats, although larger boats can cause a much greater impact. Damage occurs when boats enter shallow waters, causing the propellers to come into contact with the seagrass, catch on to those horizontal rhizomes that connect a long stretch of them, and rip, up, and rip up that seagrass. So all these pictures are of boat scarring right here around the Bay Area. If you guys have ever heard of or been to Stiltsville, a lot of people like to throw boat parties and anchor up on the, on the sandbars. So you can see just that repeated small boats, close contact, it just rips it up and it looks like scarring. Here is a wonderful publication by the Florida Sea Grant and University of Florida showing proper boating practices. Avoid brown areas as they indicate seagrass or reefs close to the surface, and then be cautious in white areas such as sandbars because they may be more shallow than they appear. Green areas are generally safe for shallow draft boats, and in blue waters, cruise on through. If you do find yourself caught in a seagrass bed or reef, stop, turn off your motor, pull it up and then push or pull out the same way you came in. Again, that difference between what a healthy seagrass bed looks like and how a bull can just do a straight strip of a scar. I will also be emailing all of today's participants a PDF about boating and angling in Biscayne Bay from the Florida Sea Grant. It has really great information about catch and release, better boating practices, reading watercolors, where you can find artificial and, and uh, 
natural reefs, and just a whole bunch more. I also want to do a shameless plug for Miami Eco Adventures. As more things are opening up in the county, if you'd like to get connected with nature with a certified and knowledgeable tour guide, we offer kayak tours, snorkeling tours, boat tours, and we also recently got clear bottom kayaks, so we'll be able to see that seagrass bed up close and personal. Here are just some conservation efforts that are being put into place to protect the seagrass. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation has water quality research in the Big Bend region. They're accelerating recovery of seagrass habitats and doing seagrass restoration projects and also integrated mapping and monitoring program along with DERM. One of the projects that I want to focus in on is the FWC's efforts to accelerate the recovery of seagrass habitats. Seagrasses can actually take years and even decades to grow back fully, as with the case of the slow growing turtle grass. The 18, in, I'm sorry, in 2018, FWC researchers first planted faster growing seagrasses like shoalgrass and manatee grass, specifically in areas affected by severe boat scarring, and then they installed PVC pipes topped with wooden blocks, as you can see right here, so that seabirds would roost and defecate, providing natural fertilizer to the fast growing seagrass. This filled in the exposed area of sand that was being carried away by high winds and waves and allowed for that turtle grass to eventually grow in as well. You can see the, the birds sitting and roosting. And this is just another great example of bird poop being white gold. So if you have any questions, please feel free to respond in the chat box. Um, I'd also like to extend a thank you to Anna Zingroni for assisting me in today's presentation, as well as Ed Pritchard and Crystal Espinoza. All right, thank you, Crystal. Sorry, Crystal, I know who you are. Thank you, Keja. And everybody, please give Keja a huge virtual round of applause. Today is her first day as a conservation conversations presenter. And I think she did a great, fantastic job on behalf of Miami Eco Adventures. They are very lucky to have her. It's just about 5.30, so if anyone has to depart, no problem. We're gonna be staying online to answer questions from the chat now. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and Keja will be sending you the link to the broadcast in the next couple of days. We hope that you'll join us next week. Please stay safe and well. And Keja, if you go ahead and turn your camera on, this way your participants can converse with you. And once you do that, I have a couple of questions ready to go. All right. The first question is from Marsha. And she's asking when sargasm and other seagrasses wash up on shore, can they be used for feeding turtles and other species? So I'm sure you've seen, especially recently, a lot of wash up along, along the shore of that sargasm seagrass, as, as you just said. I'm not sure if, turtle gra if turtles can feed on the turtle grass that washes up, but it definitely is a food source to a lot of wading birds. Um, crabs will find food in there as well. It, it is a food source for a number of animals and it is useful. Um, I think it's just more of an issue to people that maybe don't like to walk on it, but it definitely is used by the environment and by I'll different types of animals. I'll add on to what Keja just said. When stuff washes up on shore, Typically, it's not being collected for redistribution to be fed to any animal. When turtles are feeding, they're feeding on seagrasses from the bottom, from the habitat where they grow. However, as the sargasm, which is actually an algae, it's not a sea grass, it's an, actually, it's a big, very large macroalgae species or also referred to as seaweed, Sometimes that's used and it can actually help provide a little bit more uh, nourishment isn't quite the right word, but it, it's actually used to help fill out the beaches to a certain extent. And there have been studies that show that it might be a solid ingredient 
in compost. So that's right now where the science of sargasm seaweed is. Oh, I would also like to say just so that for being a compost, that would be a great solution. I think the problem that a lot of people are running into is that it also washes on shore with a lot of trash mixed in there. So it's really hard to find anything to do with it. Yeah, it's definitely very complex. And in addition to the trash, it, it would have to be sorted, but also there's a lot of regulations involved with creating co compost, especially for commercial use. And one of the big things is ridding the sargasm seaweed of the salt content so that it wouldn't, that it would be, uh, what's the word? It would be appropriate to be used as a compost ingredient. Great question, Marcia. And the second question is from Paris. Do you guys do this every Friday? Yes, we do this every Friday on different topics. Um, I'll add you onto the email list so you'll get notifications for every week's topic until the month of June. I'm adding, if you would like to be on the email list, I've just put my email address, this is Anna, into the chat box and we will only be using your email to send you these weekly topics and registration links. We also advertise the topics and the links on our social media pages. All right, follow up question from Paris. Can humans eat seagrass? I, I'm gonna answer yes to this. I feel like we can. Do we, however? I'm not sure of that answer. I don't I'm not that sure thing. either. And yeah. I'll also punt this question to Ed just to see if he has a more specific. I don't know of any specific um, <laughs> diets or anyone that's, that's tried doing that. I mean, maybe it can be, um, you know, used for other feed, but I don't think for humans. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> it is a very interesting question. Okay. From... I want to say it's Zaire. What are, and I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. What are some key benefits of seagrass and a few ways to spread more awareness? I would say the top benefits are definitely that it protects the bottom of the sea floor from storm surges, from, from storms and hurricanes and everything from being shifted around. Um, also, it's feeding ground and habitat for a number of animals. My favorite benefit of it is as a carbon sink, but again, that's, the research for that isn't as extensive as I would like to see. And a few ways to spread more awareness, I would just say be um, an advocate for better boating practices. And then also on a home front, if you don't even boat or anything like that, be aware of what you're putting in your lawn and on your grass and everything because that runoff will eventually reach the bay and reach the sea grasses. So we just wanna be careful of any fertilizers and pesticides that we're putting on that will end up in our oceans and cause algae blooms and, and affect the seagrass. Excellent response, Keja. All right, spread more awareness, okay. Do we have any final questions from the group? All right, fantastic. Well, we thank you all for participating. Oh, what are good fertilizers? Ooh, Lisa. Ooh, good question. So if you have a way to compost, that is the best fertilizer. It uses up uh, food scraps in your kitchen. Um, it's natural. There's not going to be any chemicals in there. To me, that would be the best, would be just compost from your house. Besides that, store-bought fertilizers, I really can't think of any off the top of my head. You can probably find some certified ones if you do some research. Yeah, and to add on to what Keja said, composting is certainly the most organic and most cost-effective way because you're using things that you're, you already have in your possession. And if you find the need to work with fertilizers that you're gonna have to purchase elsewhere, 
I would strongly recommend contacting your UF IFAS extension office in your county, whether it's Miami-Dade or another county in Florida, because they have an, we have a, a very specific program that's targeted towards proper landscaping and gardening, including what, how to apply certain products to your yard and to your landscape. It's not so much about good fertilizers because any, any chemical that you purchase is automatically not gonna be great for the ocean, but the larger thing is becoming educated on the proper amount to fertilize, the time of year to fertilize, the time of day to fertilize, et cetera. And even better than that, choosing plants that are what we call Florida friendly that don't require as much fertilizer or fertilizer at all, and also can withstand the really, uh, the really extreme conditions that we have here in South Florida. And I'll actually put that in the chat as well, and you can look that up because there's that there's information online about the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods program, and every county has a Florida Yards and Neighborhoods agent, extension agent. Thank you for that, Anna. That was a that's a really great resource, actually. My pleasure. Okay, I just put that in the chat. All right. Thank you for your questions, everyone. And as Keja mentioned, we are gonna continue these webinars on Fridays at 1 and 5 p.m., definitely through the end of this month. We've been doing these for a little over two months. And once we get to July, we are in the process of figuring out how we might modify when the Conservation Conversations webinars will be offered. We're, we're very aware that people's schedules are changing, our programming needs are changing. So this will likely change from the weekly webinar at two times to either bi-weekly or perhaps once a month, but we're gonna be consulting all of those who have participated to try and make that decision of when that will be. So definitely every Friday through June 26th, and in the next couple of weeks, we should know what the new schedule is and we will keep you all informed. All right, thank you again. Thank you, Keja. Fantastic thank you. job. Thank you, everyone. All right, take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.